Hello, and welcome to the Creative Writers Series with Sparrow, who will be sharing some fiction with us. So um, thank you very much for joining us, Sparrow. Oh, you're Sparrow. welcome. My pleasure. Great. It's wonderful to have you here. And um, I'll just provide a brief bio of Sparrow. So Sparrow lives in a double wide trailer in Phoenicia, New York, with his wife, Violet Snow. He has been published in The New Yorker, The Sun, American Poetry Review, Chronogram, and Ulster Publishing's newspapers, and he was once quoted in Vogue. He is the author of 11 books of prose and poetry and, run, and has run for president eight times and plays flutophone in the voluptuary pop group Fomola. We're very happy to have you with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, so I believe uh, we'll begin with a reading from the Princeton Diary. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna read pages 33 to 43. So I don't have to explain the book because people have already been reading the book in, uh, I guess, right? Um, maybe a very brief introduction. Okay, yeah, yeah so... Um, this is the diary, the journal of a guy. We never learn his first name, but his last name is Kalavakis, which is uh, Lithuanian, he explains. And um, he's a professor at Princeton. And um, he has a short term appointment. He's just going to uh, teach there for three years. And then after that, he doesn't know what's going to happen to him. Um, and uh, we don't know where he is within that three-year term, but uh, he has a very minimal life. He doesn't even have any friends. Um, he's divorced. He's an atheist. And uh, he has writer's block. Every day he sits down for two hours to write, and he can never write anything. Mm -hmm. And then his one sort of ritual in life is that he has lunch with Joyce Carol Oates, who's a famous writer, very old, maybe she's in her 85 or something, a real person. And um, his life kind of starts centering around his meetings with Joyce Carol Oates. Maybe that I've already said too much. Okay, in fact, that's what this, how this begins. I spend a lot of time thinking of witty remarks for Joyce Carol Oates. Much of this journal is a rehearsal for our lunches. The last time I saw Joyce, she was wearing a kimono with a paisley design. Attached to the kimono was a cape. It was the weirdest outfit I've ever seen on a lunch companion. I was almost paralyzed with mystification. Of course, there was no way to diplomatically ask about her attire. Princeton has the inertness of a ceramic castle in a fish bowl. Little known fact, Joyce Carol Oates's closest friends call her JC, as if to suggest the parallels between her and Jesus. Joyce herself never mentions this. I left my umbrella by the front door of my apartment and forgot to bring it in. This morning it was gone, stolen either by a man or by the wind. There's very little threat, theft in Princeton. Probably the wind was the culprit. I went to the Dollar General store in Clydesdale. There isn't one in Princeton. My goal was to spend my daily $6. I overheard a black guy saying, my wife got custody of the kids, then her mother sued her for custody, then the mother got custody, then I sued her for custody because my mother-in-law was unfit. It was obvious. But then he walked away and I never found out if he received custody. I bought raisins and a tiny flashlight. When you press the button on an elevator, you can feel it thinking, a meager but palpable thought. 
Any species of bird might be a verb. One could speak of someone seagulling or nightingaling or eagling. I wonder why our language doesn't have more of such words. There are thousands of birds, but only three bird verbs, parroting, hawking, and crowing. As a child, if I cut myself, my mother would produce a small bottle of iodine tincture and paint my wound. The bottle was brown. The top had a plastic wand attached to it. The iodine itself was a distinctive brown purple. Does anyone still do this? It was the intersection of visual art and Victorian medicine. God is probably a metaphor for the sun. All earthly life emerges from the power of one celestial being in truth. Even if God doesn't exist, we see our God above us daily. All novelists feel inferior to poets. I've begun to memorize poems to recite to JC. I started with this one by Tennyson. So this is a real poem by Tennyson. Lillian, one. Airy fairy Lillian, flitting fairy Lillian. When I ask her if she love me, claps her tiny hands above me, laughing all she can. She'll not tell me if she love me, cruel little Lillian. Two. When my passion seeks pleasance in love sighs, she, looking through and through me, thoroughly to undo me, smiling, never speaks. So innocent arch, so cunning simple, from beneath her gathered wimple, glancing with black bearded eyes, till the lightning laughter's dimple, the baby roses in her cheeks, then away she flies. Three, prithee weep, May Lillian. Gaiety without eclipse wearieth me, May Lillian. Through my every heart it thrilleth when from crimson threaded lips silver treble laughter trilleth. Prithee weep, May Lillian. Four, Praying all I can, if prayers will not hush thee, airy Lillian, like a rose leaf I will crush thee, fairy Lillian. That's a pretty weird poem. Though Joyce Carol is modest, she has an air of greatness. Dining with her is like conferring with Winston Churchill or Archimedes. I found a pair of eyeglasses on a table at Starbucks. I didn't notice them until I sat down. Just as an experiment, I tried on the spectacles. The lenses were strong. They stretched out the room and twisted it. I stood up and walked towards the bathroom, feeling like I was on mescaline. Then I took off the glasses and read the times. I'm one of the few professors who doesn't wear glasses. When I'm around the faculty, my eyes feel conspicuously naked. I went on a cow adventure, driving around looking at cows. I wonder if Joyce Carroll likes cows. I will describe it to her the next time I see her. I have hay fever, which manifests as sinus headaches. Today, I feel like a towel is balled up between my brain and my right eyebrow. People with cats spend much of their time trying to keep their pets from escaping. They're like antebellum slave owners. I can feel my wife pumping resentment into the atmosphere 220 miles away. Princeton is what New Jersey would be like 
without the mafia. Henry James, William James, Frank James, and Jesse James were all contemporaries. At our near monthly luncheon today, Joyce Carroll stared right through her omelet. I went on a cow adventure, I told her. Where did you go, she asked. Up by Point Margrave. And what exactly was your cow adventure, she asked, somewhat ironically. I drove past cows. Twice I got out and looked at them. One cow was close enough to speak to. What did you say to her? I told her my problems. And what did she say? Nothing. She was listening. But she didn't even move. She's a Freudian, Joyce decreed with a slight smile. But she didn't ask what my problems were. Also, she really loved the Tennyson poem. Everyone assumes that religion is well-intended because it speaks about love and patience and gentleness. But so do evil psychopaths. Serial killers, when they meet you on the street, say, you must learn to trust people more. The dawn today was singular, radiating ecstasies of orange, lavender, and pink through the sky. Joyce Carroll never discusses her writing or her novels. Talking to her, you might think she was an accountant or a brick mason. What's surprising is how often she mentions her childhood in upstate New York. My father once got cheated by a horse trader, she told me yesterday. The trader was an Armenian who filed down the teeth of a gelding to make the horse look younger. Once my father discovered the trick, he was furious, Joyce smiled. Joyce's father was, for many years, a farmer. Hair is unaffected by gravity. The rest of my body is always pulled down. My hair spurts upwards. I found this entry in an old journal, Alaska and Hawaii. Alaska and Hawaii entered the United States in 1959. Together they include 1,402 islands. I want to write a more realistic story, maybe one about a woman who works in a laundromat, but I can't imagine a woman who works in a laundromat. This is where I'm stuck. The sky today is withdrawn, non-committal, almost no color. I had the urge to throw a rock, so I drove to a stream outside of town I found a small rounded stone and tossed it into the water where it disappeared swiftly. It's spring, time to throw rocks. Something awful is happening to my upper back. It's like the bones are disappearing as if my inherent spinelessness is becoming literal. Would it be all right if we segue into some Q and A? Yeah. Okay, sure. Um, and these are much more general questions, um, which might be interesting uh, for some of the listeners to hear. Which is um, the first being: Have you always wanted to be a creative writer? And if not, what made you turn towards it? Um, I don't remember. Well, you know, actually, I have a very early memory. Before I could write, I have a sister two years younger than me. And, you know, we're on the floor. I'm maybe four and she's two, or I'm five and she's three, something like that. And I'm dictating to her. She's my amanuensis. She's writing down what I say, but she can't write. She doesn't know, doesn't know how to write. And so, you know, maybe that was kind of an impulse to, being, to be a writer. I know I started writing in fifth grade or that's my memory, that I started writing poetry in fifth grade. 
Mm. Possibly before that, I wanted to be a doctor. I have a memory that I wanted to be a doctor. And I don't know that I wanted, I'm not sure that I really wanted to be a writer. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, ever, <laughs> even now. It was something I sort of, it's a weird story that I think I'll now tell you. That um, I flunked out of Cornell in 1973. And I had a great desire to join the working class, to be a humble worker of some kind. Ultimately, maybe, I know I, one of my fantasies was to drive a truck, live in a trailer camp, and play Elvis Presley's songs on the guitar, on an acoustic guitar. Even though actually I didn't like Elvis Presley, but this was kind of a fantasy, a sort of working class fantasy. Maybe because my parents were communists, I had great respect for the working class. I just wanted to be a worker and ordinary person. And one of my first jobs, well, my first job after flunking out of college was working in a uh, construction site. And uh, one time, mostly I swept up after they finish uh, the apartment, you know, making an apartment, whatever you call it, building an apartment. And I would sweep up. And, but once, once the guy, my boss, asked me to dig a ditch. And so I dug this ditch. And afterwards, he said to me, you dig a good ditch. And I thought, ah, now I'm a success as a worker. But gradually, I discovered, uh, first of all, working class people didn't like me because I was a hippie. Or like something about me as a hippie just made them uncomfortable, which I can understand in retrospect, and even could kind of understand then. Mm -hmm. But I just realized I don't like uh, working class people. They don't like me. <laughs> then I started working in a natural food store. Then I discovered that I, uh, I don't really have to work very hard because I don't spend any money. I just live really simply, you know, back then I would like, I could show you my social security report. Like I would live on $1,200 a year <laughs> and save money, you know, in 1975. So I just stopped working full time. I just started working part time just because it seemed like a waste to work all week if I didn't need the money. Mm -hmm. And then I had a lot of time. And I like to write letters to my friends. So I would write the letter. Then I started copying the letters into my journals. And then when you copy a letter, you slightly modify it, edit it, though you don't think of it in those terms. I just, I was a poet. I wanted to be a poet, but it didn't spend much time being a poet. So eventually I became a writer. I just fell into it because I had too much time on my hands. <laughs> mm. And how would you describe your creative writing process? Um, well, you know, I don't really have a process. Well, here's what I do. I have an entirely ritualized life. Mm -hmm. I wake up in the morning, often late, you know, let's say as late as 10. And then I never speak until noon or actually to a minute after noon, 1201. I mean, once in a while, if something's really crucial, sometimes I'll say to my wife, can you cut these vegetables? Because I have carpal tunnel syndrome from writing too much. So, you know, I'll say one or two sentences. If the dentist calls, I'll say, yes, I'll be there too, you know, but pretty much I never speak before noon. And, you know, sometimes I wake up early, I wake up like at 8, 15. So I have all that time. And then I like lie in bed and think about my dreams. I usually have pretty vivid dreams. I just think about them. I don't try to understand what they mean. I just try to remember them, try to remember all the details, how it felt. And then after a while, my mind wanders and sometimes I think of a little poem. And, uh, and if I really like the poem, I have a hand washing exercise I do for my carpal tunnel syndrome. First, I wash my hands in cold water, as cold as I can stand it. Then I drain the sink, put in hot water, hot as I can stand it. Mm -hmm. Then I go to the computer, I have a voice activated computer because of my carpal tunnel syndrome. And then I say my poems that I thought of, my little, sometimes they're tiny little stories that are one sentence long, two sentence long. And then usually after that, I start editing my manuscripts. So I have lots of books I'm working on that mm -hmm. I never talk about, but I just, there's only one I talk about, which is uh, 
I'm writing a book about how much I hate the Beatles. So um, I work on my manuscripts. I kind of edit them, revise them, think about them. And, um, and then it's noon. Then I start talking. You know, that's uh, kind of my... And then after that, I'm pretty much not a writer. I do, you know, sometimes... I'm also a journalist. I've Once a month, I write an essay for this magazine, Chronogram. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, I'll do that in the afternoon. Usually, I'll take a break from the computer. It's too much computing, bad for my eyes. Mm -hmm. So I'll take a break till around four or five. Then I'll work on my email. I'll write letters to people. I'll do things that are kind of non-literary and, you know, mm -hmm. they're not exactly the things I'm writing. Like pretty much afternoon, I'm freed from, I don't consider myself a writer. I consider myself, oh yeah, I was gonna show this to you. A person that, that does nothing. Like my goal is to just sit around and do nothing. And then if something occurs to me, I'll write it down. And recently this Australian hippie artist was here and he did a drawing of me and he said, what should I call you? I said, well, people do call me a poet, but I really think of myself as a person that does nothing. Mm. So he made this drawing with a, uh, I think it was a crow feather, some kind of feather uh, from Australia, actually, that he dipped in ink. His name is Benny, he's got a Zabel, Benny Zabel kind of a nice drawing I think. yeah well, kind of captures something of me it does in the eyes for sure um you mentioned that you don't really think of yourself as a writer yet you have published 11 books and um i'm wondering um would you say that you lead a writer's lifestyle or what do you even think about the notion or misconceptions of what a writer should be like yeah i mean you know i think I'm just conscious of the fact that I'm speaking to young people. Uh -huh. who, although I fear that the stereotypes of what is a writer, I'm just putting these blankets a little, I'm always cold. Hmm. Um, you know, the stereotypes of what is a writer, I fear change very little from generation to generation. But anyway, in my day, uh, you know, it was very, uh, caught up with uh, Ernest Hemingway. I think like basically being a writer meant that you were someone very much like Ernest Hemingway, which means kind of a bitter, tough guy who's, you know, was very common. I don't know, if, I think maybe they still do this. Like these literary novelists on the back of the uh, book, they'll say, you know, Edgar Flint, Flint has worked as a short order cook a longshoreman, a uh, busboy, you know, they always have like lots of tough guy jobs. <laughs> and, and, you know, of course, women is a different role, the women writer, but even the women writers, I think, were a lot like the men writers. They smoked cigarettes, drank whiskey, have the typewriter clattering. They're kind of tormented pull out the page, rip it up, ah, this is no good, you know? They're perfectionists, they're, you know, they have this kind of troubled air of, you know, it's a sort of Western version of a sage, you know, like they're, they're trying to get the muse to come down into them, a lot of struggle, very miserable life, you know? <laughs> I just read this book actually, that I found in the street in, in Brooklyn, it was a series of quotes from Ernest Hemingway about being a writer. <laughs> oh. It's pretty good actually. But, um, you know, so I, I don't know, to me like a writer is a very serious person, you know? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, what happened with me was, you know, I sort of realized at some point that I was not capable of being a great writer. And that really, that basically what I'm capable of doing, what I like doing, and probably the only thing I'm really good at doing is just making little jokes to myself. Mm -hmm. You know, that section, that I read from this book, you know, some of it is stuff that really happened to me, but to mm -hmm. me, it's just full of jokes. It's just mm -hmm. full of private jokes that I think are, uh, that are funny to me. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're not, I'm sort of the opposite uh, of, of these, of a so-called writer. Mm -hmm. And also since I don't literally write, you know, I 
really don't write. I, right. I talk into my computer and the mm-hmm. computer writes. Mm-hmm. So in a sense, I think of myself, and I know this is even more pretentious than calling yourself a writer, but I, to be honest, I think of myself as more like a shaman who oh. like the shaman, you know, goes into a trance, mm-hmm. has a journey. I don't even know much about shamanism, but this is my image of what a shaman is. Goes into a trance, has a journey, has a kind of a revelation about something, and then goes down to the uh, the fire, you know, mm-hmm. where everyone is sitting, where the tribe is sitting, mm-hmm. and explains to them, "Well, this is what I saw," you know, mm-hmm. and and you know, and there's no writing. It's not a writer. Right. It's a talker mm-hmm. and a, a person who has these kind of experiences. And so you've met so many different types of creative writers at different points in their development or even their careers as writers. I'm curious, are there any qualities that you think a creative writer should have or may be beneficial to have or to cultivate? Hmm. Yeah, um, I studied with uh, this um, this poet, um, uh, Philip Whalen who was Mm -hmm. a Zen monk when I studied with him. He had a brown robe, shaved head. And one of the things he said was, uh, a poet must take walks. (laughs) And uh, and his poems are very much, you feel him taking walks in his poems. They're Mm -hmm. almost recordings uh, of walks. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one thing that I could, I think that there's a way that that poets uh, read Mm-hmm. Uh, in particular poets, but I suppose, I don't know that many fiction writers and I don't quite understand the ones I know, but I know that there is a way that poets read. And I think that fiction writers uh, probably read slightly differently, but it's a very close reading. Mm-hmm. It's a way of reading sentence by sentence. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of studying the book as you're reading it and stopping and and just experiencing great sentences Mm -hmm. that um, and reading great books like Philip Marinovich uh, reads a lot is always reading Shakespeare and I'm always reading Shakespeare. I mean, I do think that reading at one time I was reading (laughs) only like Shakespeare and the New York Post, like reading something very high, something so good, your mind can't even reach it. And then reading something really stupid. Although in fact, the the Post is is a great, actually my my real poetry mentor, Ted Berrigan, he said, all poets must read the New York Post. (laughs) Because it's written, how to describe it, like a punch in the face. Like the New York Times is a terribly written newspaper, in my opinion. Mm. Meandering, redundant. It sounds terrible. It just has no poetic sense. Whereas, um, and in, and weirdly, while I was studying with Ted, the probably the most famous New York Post headline, which was, uh, I think it was, headless body found in topless bar, um, okay. came out. And I put that uh, headline in a poem of mine that I submitted to him before it became, you know, it became a refrigerator magnet eventually. It became very famous and now is, I guess, probably forgotten. Um, so I think, I think really reading for pleasure yeah. is important. I once took this course, I was studying it. SUNY New Paltz to be a secondary English teacher, which I never became, but I studied it. And they had a course, Reading for Pleasure. And you had to like find a book that was not, not great literature that you wanted to read just because it was fun. And um, I think reading for pleasure, like I read a lot of detective novels. You can find me if you're looking, if you know how to find me on Goodreads, I obsessively Mm -hmm write a review of every book I read and list every book I read. I read a lot of comic books. I mean, I love reading comic books. I don't know that I read a lot of comic books. Well, there's someone my age, I read a lot of comic books. I mean, real comic books, but also uh, 
you know, so-called graphic novels. I don't like that term. Mm, yeah, I, I, well, certainly the major thing you can do as a writer is just waste enormous amounts of time. Just have a lots of time to do nothing. You know, the idea that you're trying to produce some great work of writing, that's really a big mistake. I mean, for me, you know, at least, and probably for everyone. And also, uh, no idea is too small. Mm -hmm. If you have like, uh, you know, let's say you're lying in bed, you're thinking of this novel that you want to write, you know, about a woman in Paris uh, in the 1930s, works in fashion, you know, and you think and you think and you think, you have this whole novel kind of played out in your mind. And then you think, you know, and then there's, you have like a line, you know, she woke up at three and reached for a cigarette. And like, that, that's sort of where you come to in your thinking. And you, you just sort of like that line. It's not a great line, admittedly, it's somewhat derivative, but you have something about it you like. Then just write it down. You know, mm -hmm. just write down whatever you have. Don't write the whole novel all at once. Just write down that line you like and save it somewhere. You need a good filing system to find these things. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of people can't find stuff they write. But, you know, if uh, with Google, it's very easy to, if you have everything in one file and then you know it has the word cigarette in it, you, you search for that. Anyway, and you, you just save these little stray fugitive thoughts because uh, either they may add up to something. Someone once told me that John Ashbery, my friend who was John Ashbery's assistant said that he had this bowl. I always picture it as a silver bowl and it's full of, you know, this is before the internet. Uh, it's full of single lines that he typed on a typewriter and then cut out. Mm -hmm. And he put it in the bowl and he would pick out one line at a time from the bowl and put them in his poems. And my, and Ted Berrigan said, if you're stuck for a line in a poem, just reach to a book, open it, uh, put your finger down and put in that line. And that's one thing that I believe in, uh, come to think of it. Something I practice a lot is random book opening. Mm -hmm. There's a way to do it where you say your mantra first, and there's a way to do it where you just do it impulsively fast. Let me show you how to do it. Okay, let's see what this says here. One corollary of all the detective novels to which a goodly share of mankind repairs for refreshment specifies that a crime present its investigators with a picture, the material and so to speak stylistic elements of which if meticulously assembled and analyzed permit a sure solution. That's from this book I just lately read called To Each His Home to each his own. Mm -hmm. so this guy, Leonardo Sciascia is how I would pronounce it. Uh, he was an Italian uh, novelist. I think this is 1968, this book. And there's this great uh, publishing company, uh, NYRB, New York Review Books. Every book they put out is really good. Mm -hmm. A little depressing maybe, but really good. You, these sort of forgotten masterpieces or whatever the near masterpieces of uh, kind of usually literature of the last, you know, 80 years, 50 years. Well, thank you for all of these recommendations and techniques that could be mm. very helpful when these writers may be stuck. Mm. Um, I guess maybe I'll uh, wrap up this interview with just one last open question. Uh, if you happen to have any advice for new budding creative writers. Oh, yeah, I did write down some advice I scrupulously prepared for this um, interview. And, um, well, I just don't write down what I wrote. Uh, collaborate with someone else. Mm -hmm. You write the easy part of the book and let the other person write the hard part. <laughs> and, uh, in fact, this book, um, it began as a collaboration with my friend uh, Jim Graham, who lives 
in a squad just outside Paris. He and mm -hmm. I were going to write a novel together. And he sort of insisted we do it by actual physical letters that we mailed back and forth to each other. And we started doing it and it just seemed like it was not going to work, you know, as a technique. And so I just kept going and wrote the book myself. And I was going to, what's the word, dedicated to him, but I either I forgot or my publisher forgot. Okay, part two, listen to your dreams. They will teach you what to write about. And, you know, you can just write down your dreams, but I meant something different than that, like yeah. the, the flavor of your dreams are, is going to point you in the right direction, which, as I said, that's kind of what I do in the morning. And then this is my third and last suggestion. Write a song. You might find it easier than writing serious poems and essays. You can steal the melody from someone else. I write a lot of songs or I write a fairly large amount of songs. And um, I just kind of imagine that maybe young people would find it easier to write a song than to write a, a book. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know, no, that's, um, you know, I mean, I, I think I, one of the things I wrote in the here is, you know, don't take it too seriously. You know, it's not that important. No one reads books. They're kind of over. So, uh, you know, it's not that important. So just, um, you know, if you, en if you enjoy it, I think it's more important to enjoy it than to write something great. In that way, I am the opposite of uh, Hemingway and Faulkner and all those suffering geniuses that I grew up in the shadow of. I think, you know, I like, to me, it's sort of a game, like uh, doing a crossword puzzle. It's a little bit like doing a crossword puzzle in reverse. In fact, that's one thing you can do is you can just uh, pick up a crossword puzzle. I don't know if young people have physical objects anymore, but if somehow, I guess you could do this, print out <laughs> from the New York Times a crossword puzzle and just fill in the, uh, the letters, the blank letters. You see what I'm saying? Just fill them in however you want. They don't even have to be the same length as the words. And, you know, it's one way to write something. Sure, you can I, go from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and I think for me, visual art, like in this book, The Princeton Diary, I think I, I find myself more and more interested in visual art and less and less interested in writing. Even though I'm still writing, I'm writing maybe as much as, as ever, I don't know. But I think for me, you know, working in visual art, let me just show you some of my recent works. <laughs> this guy actually that, um, I think wow. I showed this. The guy, Benny Zabel, the guy that did that drawing of me that mm -hmm. I showed before, yeah. he took out a piece of art paper he had a like a what do you call it a um, tablet of paper mm -hmm. and uh to to draw me he pulled out a page and it was attached to the to the rings by these little um, strange little end pieces so they ended up on my floor and i picked it up and i said that's kind of pretty I'll just put it on the back of this envelope that I get from these Hasidic Jews that send me this magazine. And then I always sign them, so scrupulously sign my name. And there's some smeared um, glue that got loose that is kind of part of the art in a way. Mm -hmm. And you know, I just think like looking at visual art, for me, looking at visual art, making visual art, working in a medium where there's no words except my name which is not even my real name <laughs> um you know i think it helps me think in a whole i think you this is one here's a really good idea i have um that maybe we'll end with is one thing i like to do is kind of just lie in bed and just picture the whole thing that i'm writing picture the book, not like a physical object, more like a metaphysical object. 
like how will the whole book look how will it feel kind of and i just sort of contemplate it in its finished form in a way it's sort of the purpose of the book but it's not so it's not like a theme that they teach you that that um, you know writing has themes oh yeah here's another good advice break all the rules you know, whatever these, whatever they teach you. I like to get these uh, magazines, what are they called? The Writer or Writer's Digest. And they give you all these uh, amazing advice, probably all terrible advice, but I just love reading it. And it's like, how to set the mood. And it'll be like, mood is very important in all fiction. Mood can be set through a number of methods by, uh, by the lighting, by the atmosphere, by the weather, by the um, by even dialogue will affect mood. You know, and it's like it's all nonsense. But uh, I just kind of like these all this advice, and then just break all the rules. Don't follow any of that advice. <laughs> don't follow my advice. You know, just don't be afraid to write something that's complete nonsense. You know. That's that's uh, like when I was studying with Ted Berrigan, I submitted to him a sonnet. It was just the word the 140 times. And he looked at me and he said, well, you know, I'm an avant-gardist. Like, you're not shocking me. And now that I think of it, it's a terrible poem. <laughs> but it's a good try. And uh, I was kind of on the right track. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know what I was doing yet. So, you know, be bold. Uh, foolish, very important to be foolish. I'm giving too much advice, but anyway, I'm supposed to give advice. But anyway, I'm feeling too much like a like a self-important sage. But uh, you know, I I just think that um, everyone misunderstands everything. And remember, you're like a terrible editor. This is this is everyone. Everyone has one problem. All writers have the same problem. They they want to write something great. And their idea of something great is T.S. Eliot, James Joyce, something that, first of all, has already been written, is out of date, can no longer exist in this world. And um, it, it's all wrong. The great thing, in order to write something great, you have to write something terrible. You have to try to write terribly. Because if you try to write great, you'll just sound like a ninth rate uh, imitation of T.S. Eliot. And uh, which is okay, you can do that all you want, but it won't get you anywhere in my humble opinion. Whereas if you just think I'm gonna write the stupidest goddamn thing that comes into my head, something so awful, something that'll make your mother weep if she sees it. That I think is more on the right path. In fact, I've thought of this, you know, like I don't like to think of myself as a creative writer. I like to think of myself as a destructive writer. <laughs> you know, I think it's better to write with the intention to destroy rather than with the intention to create. You know, to, to write in a way that just makes everyone unhappy. <laughs> Funny idea. Oh, I don't think your writing does that at all. I'm not saying it does that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think what I'm trying to say to myself is I tend to want, in fact, I wrote this in my copious notes. I tend to try to want to be entertaining, even right now. Uh -huh. And and I think I need to fight that tendency in myself. Mm -hmm. And I think the desire, it's not like, in fact, it's paradoxical is what I'm saying. You know, yeah. if you try to write a great poem like T.S. Eliot, you'll end up just boring people and making people unhappy. Whereas mm -hmm. if you try to write something that would make T.S. Eliot literally collapse in his grave with misery, you quite likely will write something that is beautiful and exalted. If you try to write something beautiful and exalted, you will fail. If you try mm -hmm. to write something destructive that will make your mother, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, distraught, you, you may well write something good. That's all I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not saying you, you know, but you have to have that intention, that destructive intention, the intention, because you're young. I'm talking to young people. Young people, their, their purpose in the world is to destroy the old. Mm -hmm. You know, that's their, their mission. That's their fate. Even if they don't want to, that's what they have to do. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a virtuous mission. 
at least here in the USA, my friend Murat Namet Najat, who's a, a Turkish Jew, he says, you know, in, in other cultures, people have, uh, you know, mentors that they follow and uh, that they kind of, like a lineage, you know what I'm saying? And uh, that they continue. Whereas in America, you have to break the lineage. It doesn't work to have a lineage. For some reason, this culture is not, you know, designed for lineage. It's designed to, to break with, constantly with the past. Why, I don't know. Well, maybe because of the way it was founded. It was founded by a bunch of people who didn't want to live in Europe. <laughs> and a bunch of people who wanted to live in Africa that couldn't. <laughs> you know, people that broke with the past. And even the poor Native Americans, in a way, got shattered. In a, you know, it's a, it's a land of shattered souls. <laughs> so the only hope is to shatter them further. <laughs> and then maybe once they're completely atomized, they'll find something. Freedom. <laughs> a completely insane theory that I just invented. Well, there's a lot of wisdom in it. And um, who knows, maybe the outcome will be something beautiful and original. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, but you can't think that way. You have to just sure. think, you know, I want to be a fool. You know, that's, I, anyway, for me, this is how it works. I, who knows what everyone else should do. I'm sure there's like, you know, in my opinion, there's probably, you know, of, of 40,000 writers, there's 40,000 ways to write. So, you know, there's not really a, I'm just giving you the best, I'm telling you how to be me, which maybe you shouldn't be, but that's all I can do really effectively, I think. <laughs> well, it's wonderful. And thank you very much for sharing. Thank you, it. Jimmy. It was a great fun. Really. Thank you. Well, I'm going to pause the recording now, but thank you for your wonderful reading and for your words of wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. Ha, <laughs> ha.